species need to adapt to environmental stresses in order to survive and reproduce. Some species can adapt to new situations surprisingly fast, such as certain herbivores of crop species to pesticides. Other species have less potential to evolve resistance, such as many threatened species to a warming climate. Professor Dr. Ari Hoffman from the University of Melbourne is investigating how stressful events influence evolutionary rates and how species adapt to changing conditions. Ari explains to us the mechanism behind rapid evolutionary changes and shares his perspective on the effect of global warming in our natural world. Harry, much of your research centers on rapid evolutionary responses of species to envi environmental stresses. Mm. Can you tell us why species need to respond to changing environments and how they achieve this? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, species are um, changing all the time. All populations of species are changing all the time. And they have to because environments change all the time. So we have, you know, we have many cases where the changes can be quite simple. And... Um, so examples of rapid evolution that were first described really involve things like um, insecticides and antibiotics and also in plants, heavy metals. So when humans change the environment, species had to adapt. So of course, when insects are being sprayed by pesticides, then the insects can sometimes very, very rapidly um, evolve to actually become resistant to those pesticides. And, um, and even when uh, you know, plants are exposed to heavy metals, such as occurs in mine tailings, those plants can have done very quickly. So within a few generations, you can go from having a susceptible insect or a susceptible plant to one that is actually tolerant to metals or to pesticides very, very quick. And herbicides are the same sort of thing when it comes to weeds. So we know from those sorts of examples that there's lots of examples of rapid evolution in the environment in response to anthropogenetic stresses. So, you know, human related stresses are very common and animals can adapt to those. Um, insects and plants are one example, but you've also got things like, you know, rats and mice adapting to the poisons that we try and use to try and control those sorts of things. So when the selection is very severe, then we can see very rapid responses to selection. But I think, you know, I think the world has changed in the way we view selection and responses to selection in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, we now realize that animals and plants are adapting much more subtly to all sorts of other changes that are also happening in the environment. So there's marine animals in the um, estuarine environments where you're getting salinity gradients. They can adapt to those um, quite rapidly. And of course, we're also seeing animals and plants starting to adapt to environmental changes associated with climate. And of course, that's incredibly important. So there are many examples now of animals and plants adapting along climate gradients. And of course, they've been doing that for millions of years, you know, because, you know, you find that a lot of species occur across a whole range of climates. And um, in the past, you've had these evolutionary changes that have occurred. And if you take a plant or an animal, it doesn't matter if it's a fly or something else, um, from one environment, maybe a tropical environment, then you take a population from a cooler area, then you find they're quite different. They differ genetically quite substantially. Mm -hmm. So the process that's involved, which was the other part of your question, um, can be simple or it can be complicated. So what we're talking about here are DNA-based changes. And in some cases, such as responses to specific toxins like um, insecticides, you can sometimes get a very, very simple genetic change that underlies the rapid evolution. So we call, you know, so one example of that is what we call target site resistance. So a chemical may target a particular, um, a particular pathway in an insect to kill it. Um, and what you can then do is you can actually change the protein molecule in such a way that, that target is no longer available to the pesticide. So that's something that can happen very quickly. So when you get your spray can out and you try and kill your cockroach, and the cockroach survives, and um, it may have one of these target site mutations that stops it being killed. On the other hand, we have another phenomenon where um, adaptation, adaptation involves many, many different types of genes. You know, it might be tens or even hundreds of genes that are actually involved. And typically, when you look at climate change adaptation, you get a whole range of genes that can change. Um, so when you have a species that's adapted to warmer conditions or drier conditions, 
And typically, many genes are involved, and we call that a polygenic response. And uh, that, of course, means that you'll often have genes changing all across the genome of that species. Much more complicated to study, um, but that's certainly a very common pattern. So it can be complex, can be simple. It just depends on the situation you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So evolution is generally perceived as taking incredibly long time spans. Yeah? Yeah. As, but as you already said, your research shows that changes can manifest yeah. very rapidly, actually. So you gave us a lot of examples, but can you mm. give us another very specific one, how fast evolution can happen, maybe also in terms of generations or time scales, and the conditions under which these rapid changes are normally observed these days? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, there are cases of uh, pesticide resistance evolving in um, two or three years. Mm. So it might only involve, you know, a few tens of generations can get resistance happening. So it can be extremely quickly, um, that whole process. And that's, of course, a challenge because, you know, if you're creating a new type of chemical to control a pest species, then that chemical becomes ineffective once you've had that evolutionary process occur. Mm. So that's one of the, uh, what's one of the challenges that we face. So some, you know, some changes are very rapid, some changes are very slow, and it depends which species you're looking at too. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of climate change adaptation, for instance, it probably takes in the order of a few tens of um, years to actually get adaptation happening. It's polygenic, more complicated, and it can take quite a while to happen. So yeah, of course, climate change will perhaps be one of the major leading causes of biodiversity loss worldwide, and common argument you may hear every now and then is that species will adapt to these changes, yeah? So they will probably exaggerate the biodiversity loss we will experience in the future. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what is what is your perspective on this argument? Is there something true <laughs> in it or do you think this is, as you said, not happening? Yeah, look, um, I mean, the word adaptation is quite a complicated word, right? So when you talk about adaptation, it could be that you're changing the physiology of an organism, so it becomes um, adapted by acclimation to the new condition. So if there's all of a sudden heat stress, then it might experience a pre-lethal heat stress to which it can acclimate. So that allows it to actually handle the more severe stress, that so we call that acclimation. Um, so animals can certainly acclimate quite a lot. Um, so that's not a genetic change, no evolution involved, but simply a rapid response through the change in physiology. And a lot of acclimation involves timing. Um, so if you look at, say, birds, I mean, birds are starting to nest early in some areas because a lot of the insects that they're using as food are coming out earlier. Uh, you know, climate change is reducing the severity of winters. And as a consequence, um, you have a situation where the insects um, can actually take advantage of that situation to start feeding and, of course, developing earlier. And the birds respond, in this case, by acclimation, in a way, to start um, feeding and nesting earlier. So that's not a genetic change. That's a change that involves something we call plasticity, which is quite a complicated process. There's a number of different components, but it's a non-genetic change. So that's one level, if you like, right? One level of change. Um, the second level of change when you talk about adaptation is that you may get um, epigenetic changes happening. Um, and people are, you know, describing those for different types of organisms, but including plants and animals and fish and all sorts of things these days. And, you know, epigenetic changes are changes that last for longer than one generation. So it's not an instantaneous change that you revert back to once the, um, the conditions have changed again, but it's one that lasts for a generation or two. So, you know, if you grow, say, plants in a, a hot environment or a dry environment, then their offspring may be better at dealing with that particular environment through an epigenetic change. And then eventually it will wear out. So the third level is where you're talking about evolutionary change, and that's where you're getting adaptation, changing the DNA of an organism in such a way that particular genes are selected and favored. And, um, and then, of course, they can manage to do all that condition. So three levels. One level is very common, which is the plastic one, uh, but that can only take you so far normally. So there's a certain limit to the extent to which you can acclimate. You know, it's a bit like when you go to a high elevation, right? <laughs> Initially, when you go to a high elevation site, um, you have trouble with your physical activity, but if you stay for a while, then of course you can handle it. So that's an acclimation response.
Um, but if you really wanted to live at a high elevation for a long period of time, you'll probably find that you'll probably need some genetic changes in the nature of you know, the way that the oxygen is carried around your blood and that sort of thing. So then we need a genetic change. Acclimation can take you so far, and epigenetic can take you a bit further, but ultimately you probably need some sort of genetic change to still to good set of conditions. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So this is probably what, what we need or what species we'll need in the future then. So if we stick to climate change and our other crises that are all around us, like biodiversity yeah. loss, deforestation and so on, so what is your outlook on the future? What do you think the world so, will look like in 50 to 100 <laughs> years, let's say? So, I, you know, I, th I think some organisms are going to be able to do it quite well. And, um, you know, we've got some evidence of that. And particularly the weedy species, what we call weedy species, right? Ones that are sort of capable of exploding very quickly and doing quite well. And they're often very good at evolution. They're very good at actually adapting to conditions. So you might have a new pest that enters Australia. It's a bit like rabbits, right? When rabbits entered Australia, you know, there's been lots of evolution in rabbits that have allowed them to adapt to Australian conditions. And if you compare a rabbit in Australia versus a rabbit in the UK, it's totally different. <laughs> it looked different. Right? So that's an example of an invasive species that's come and is able to adapt. So we call it a weedy species, right? one that can spread well of its population quickly and do quite well. So those are probably okay to some extent. They can deal with a reasonable amount of change. Um, but the ones that really are problematical are the ones that are sort of much more restricted in the distribution. So they often occur at a small population size when you've got a small population size. Um, and then, you know, particularly threatened species, of course, then you don't have as much genetic variation in your population. And when you lack genetic variation in your population, it's often harder to adapt. So we talked before about these polygenic responses, many genes, and you have to sort of you know change in order to get a response. If you don't have much genetic variation, that's much much harder to achieve. So small threatened populations and restricted environments are going to find it much harder to adapt. So if you go to an Australian rainforest, then I suspect a lot of those species um, may well go extinct because they cannot adapt to conditions that are actually changing. You're talking about an urban environment, the species that can invade urban environments, they're probably going to be much more capable of adaptation. So it depends what we're talking about. Specialized species are much more in trouble than species that are not restricted. And we've shown that with flies, you know, we've done lots of experiments with flies where we looked at the adaptive capacity. And if you take the ones that are widespread, they can do quite well. If you take the ones that are actually restricted to a few Habitats such as, you know, alpine areas or, um, or rainforests in Queensland, they can't do very much. They get very slow rates of adaptation. Right? Yeah, species dependent, unfortunately. Harry, a lot of your research is or uses insect as models. Yes. Do you have a favorite species? <laughs> no, look, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like insects because you can experiment with them and the generation time is quite slow. But I also like the species that, are, that have got quite unusual characteristics. Um, so we do quite a lot of work at the moment on wingless grasshoppers. Of the, there's a family called Morobines, which are uniquely Australian. Right? You only find these, this um, group of grasshoppers in Australia. And they're quite weird looking. They look like matchsticks. <laughs> and, um, and they used to be very common, but we have you know one or two species now that are becoming threatened and, and being reduced quite severely in the distribution. And um, we've got others that are obviously hanging on quite well. Um, so yeah, so I quite like those because you know they are unique. They have some unique characteristics, such as this flightless ability, and um, and of course they are incredibly important from biodiversity point of view because they provide food or for all sorts of um, other life forms, including lizards and birds and what have you. Um, but flies do as well, of course. So, so yeah, I've done a lot of work um, on insects because I find them interesting models um, from an ecological genetics point of view. But we also do quite a lot of work on, on um, species that are important from a health point of view, an agricultural point of view. So we take a lot of the research that we've done in Drosophila and we apply it to things like thrips. You know, thrips are a pest species. And mites, mites are a pest species, big species, big pest species of Australian agriculture. And at the moment, we're doing a lot of work on aphids. So these are invasive species. They have a high adaptive capacity and we want to understand how we can actually control them. And of course, we also got a lot of work on mosquitoes that spread diseases. And again, they have an enormous adaptive capacity. And, uh, and again, understanding those sorts of things is very important if you're trying to control them.
we want to see how differentiated they are genetically in, in order to control them. So we work on, and both ends, you know, we work on the, the bio, the conservation side of the biodiversity side, but also very much on the applied side. But we use similar techniques to actually understand that. Yeah. Mm. So we like to speed up evolution in some cases, but we like to slow it down in other cases. And, um, but I think, you know, I mean, insects and, and, and other invertebrates are undervalued in models. And, and a lot of what we establish is then applied to other organisms. So we're also involved in, in projects with marsupials, for instance, there's a lot of the you know, the principles that we establish around genes moving in the landscape and around genetic variation of populations, um, we then apply to understanding um, how you can actually conserve marsupials. So we've been quite heavily involved in um, the mountain pygmy possum project, a threatened species under the mountains, of, and, you know, it's very restricted in its distribution. And, you know, we've shown through translocation, bringing in new genetic material that you can actually boost those populations quite substantially. And um, that's been quite an important project for us to illustrate some of the learnings that you get on insects and apply them much more widely. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, I'm a biologist and I like to work on all forms of life in a sense. And insects are useful models and they're important from a pest point of view and a health point of view. Um, but yeah, I don't see myself as being organism restricted necessarily. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ari, for, for your time.